Thank you very much. And uh, as a way of some opening comments, I'd like to thank all of you for allowing an old man to uh, deliver his Jeremiah. And also my wife, I'd like to thank her because many of these ideas were bounced off of her and often at times when I'm sure that's the last thing she wanted to hear uh, was something regarding uh, my thoughts on faith, um, reason, and science. Uh, as a way of further preparatory comments, uh, I'd like to give some of the background as to why I became so interested in this topic. Uh, Paul Johnson, the great Catholic historian, uh, has identified moral relativism as the most destructive force in modern society. As an inclusive descriptive comment, he, pro he is probably correct, as it, as it has given rise to all of the cultural degeneration and decay we have witnessed for at least the last 75 years. David Carlin, who was a 12-year uh, 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 senator from the uh, state of Rhode Island, uh, before he decided that uh, politics was too corrupt and uh, he left and is now teaching at the um, community college in Rhode Island, teaching philosophy and sociology, wrote a book some years ago called The Decline and Fall of the Catholic Church in America. He also noted that cultural relativism's popularity helped undermine the American moral code, eroding the Christian claim that this code had universal validity. It taught that the prevailing American moral code had no legitimate authority. Anne Glynn Jones, in her brilliant book, Holding Up a Mirror, How Civilizations Decline, reinterpreted in a detailed fashion much of the research data of Paterum Sorokum, published in his famous Social and Cultural Dynamics, um, basically a, a four-volume work published as far back as 1937 through 1941. Its uh, impact on Christianity uh, has been profound. In addition, when the social Marxists had to flee Hitler in the 1930s, they relocated in our Eastern universities with the firm conviction that rather than attempt to seize power first and impose a cultural revolution from above, they argued they must first change the culture. To change a culture would require a long march through the institutions, the arts, cinema, theater, schools, colleges, seminaries, newspapers, magazines, and the electronic media. Of course, radio was the only electronic media at that time. But think about what I just rattled off and think of the impact on all of those disciplines uh, over the years. Antonio Gramsci, who died about a year after being released from an Italian prison, urged his fellow Marxists to form popular fronts with Western intellectuals who shared their contempt for Christianity and bourgeoisie culture and who shaped the mind of the young. The message was loud and clear, it's the culture, stupid. Since Western culture had given birth to capitalism and sustained it, if that culture could be subverted, the system would self-destruct. He said, quotes, uh, end of quotes, must, we must first de-Christianize the West. And uh, I think if you take a quick look at some of our most prestigious universities, one can only conclude that they have been very, very uh, successful to date. Um, I'd like to turn now, before I start the, the body of the presentation of Faith, Reason, and Science, to Stephen Hawking, whom I'm sure everybody is uh, knowledgeable of in some uh, capacity. Uh, in his brief history of time, Stephen Hawking makes the following statement. Galileo, perhaps more than any other single person, was responsible for the birth of modern science. His renowned conflict with the Catholic Church was central to his philosophy. For Galileo was the first to argue that man could hope to understand how the world works and moreover that we could do this by observing the real world. If we <clears throat> paraphrase his beliefs, they are as follows. Modern science is radically different from any science that came before it. Galileo was largely responsible for its birth. Catholicism is at least in some ways, or at least was in Galileo's time, intrinsically opposed to modern science. Galileo was the first to argue that man could hope to understand that the world works according to intelligible principles. Five, he was the first to argue that we could understand it by observing it. This presentation will address these assertions which are simply not true but are a product of a combination of historical ignorance and or revision. By focusing on the relationship of faith, reason, and science, we can correct these mistakes and misconceptions of the past. 
Sources for our conclusions include Myra Tain's The Degree of Degrees of Knowledge and Anthony Rizzi's The Science Before Science, A Guide to Thinking in the 21st Century, an absolutely brilliant book. The voluminous works of the late Father Stanley Jockey are also recommended without any reservation. Before I start, it's important to remember that there are three criteria only that are necessary for a valid science. The world, one, the world exists independent of us. Two, we can understand the world. It's ordered and intelligible. Three, we should be confident in observing and explaining the laws of nature. Let us start now on, on faith, uh, science, and reason. The purpose of, of my presentation, I won't be able to go through all of this uh, in the time allotted, but that's why you have handouts. I think this is something to be uh, reinforced uh, in the quiet of your study, uh, and hopefully I can uh, stimulate some people to go out and, and uh, risk uh, defending our faith um, from, from the, this kind of perspective. Anyway, the purpose of this presentation is threefold. There is no intrinsic conflict between faith, reason, and science. Two, scientism is pseudoscience and is easily refutable. Three, the answer is a return to realistic epistemology and metaphysics with the ability to distinguish between the ontological, the imperial metric, and the imperial schematic levels of observation and conceptualization. It is a failure to do this by most of uh, our so-called agnostic and atheistic sciences that lead them to pontificate from their um, area of expertise philosophically without them even being aware that they're making meta metaphysical statements. A classical example is Darwinism. Now, I'm not talking about evolution per se, I'm talking about Darwinism and, and, and the metaphysical hypothesis of natural selection. That's what it is. It is not a proven fact. There are all kinds of gaps and holes uh, in, in most of our hypothesis about uh, origins, and uh, many of these individuals do not understand that what they are doing is coming from a philosophical or metaphysical position, which is really outside their field of expertise and for which they really don't have any background or training. Uh, uh, Richard Dawkins would be a classic example of this. Uh, in trying to uh, set the tone for this, we're going to begin with a brief review of Pope John Paul's salient conclusions in Fides et Ratio, that is, faith and reason. A failure to incorporate faith and reason in evaluating which true science can validly attain or cannot attain deteriorates into scientism and ultimately into skepticism, nihilism, and despair. Scientism is best defined as a thesis that the Methods of natural science should be used in all areas of investigation, including philosophy, the humanities, and the social sciences. It is a belief that only such methods can fruitfully uh, be applied in the pursuit of knowledge. Scientism essentially began during the Enlightenment and today is described as reductive materialism employing a rigid methodologic, methodological naturalism. That means total exclusion of anything uh, supernatural. As such, it is a false metaphysics leading to moral relativism, political correctness, and destructive class envy masked as multiculturalism. In other words, there is no place for the transcendent in individuals embracing scientism. For an excellent uh, exposition of this, I, I refer you, and, and this paper is, all, is referenced uh, in detail, but I refer you to Stanley Jockey's the Relevance of Physics, which was written in 1966 and has uh, two chapters, chapter 11 and 12, that deal with scientism and the cultural impact of physics. So even as far back as, what is that, uh, 45 years ago, he had brilliantly outlined uh, the basic problems that we're still struggling with. John Paul repeatedly noted that faith and reason are like, and this is a quote, that faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises <clears throat> to the contemplation of truth. And God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth, in a word to know himself, so that by knowing and loving God, men and women may also come to know the fullness of truth about themselves. He noted that human reason, reduced in modern times to empirical rationality, 
has forgotten what it means to be human with tragic consequences. One can only uh, reflect on the 20th century uh, you know, for hard, hard data uh, validating that uh, conclusion. With the loss of the standards of order, goodness, and intelligibility, our culture has reduced morality to relativism, a utilitarian calculus devoid of true reason. How many times have we heard that may be true or right for you, but it is not necessarily true or right for me. One symptom of this is the growth of scientism fueled by the hostile atheism of such writers as Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Lewis. I'm sure many of you have read uh, some of their books and, and um, uh, recognize how false uh, and superficial they are. As John Paul pointed out, scientism has as its roots an incomplete understanding of knowledge, of reality, and of humanity, which can only be reversed by a return to first principles. In this case, the principles of natural philosophy. An example, Daniel Dennett, whom I believe teaches at Boston University and uh, has written many books, uh, probably his most uh, known book is called Darwin's Dangerous Idea, in which he takes natural selection and makes a, um, almost a religious doctrine out of it, calling it a universal assage w w which dissolves and destroys every other perspective uh, with it. And as you know, natural selection is, is, is unproven. It uh, uh, mathematically is probably, if, if not impossible, at least highly improbable. And for many people, it's myself included, it's nigh, very near to being a tautology. In returning uh, to the work of St. Thomas, the exemplar of natural philosophy, it is possible to rediscover science proper and to find a means of returning the world to an integrated view of faith and reason. The late father Stanley Jockey, in his sentinel work, The Relevance of Physics, discusses in depth the fate of physics as a result of scientism. The official Catholic position on faith and reason was most authoritatively summarized by the First Vatican Council in its dogmatic constitution on Catholic faith, which contained a chapter dedicated to the theme of faith and reason. Vatican I endorsed the works of St. Thomas, and a decade later in 1879, Pope Leo XIII uh, published his encyclical Eterni Patris, proposing St. Thomas as a thinker whose synthesis of faith and reason should be accepted as a solid foundation from which to grapple with more recent questions in philosophy. Leo XIII is a very interesting um, uh, pope. He was supposed to live one or two years at, uh, when he was, uh, became pope at age 68. He lived uh, on to age 91 and was very productive during all of those years and has probably written two of, of the most famous encyclicals um, uh, written. Uh, with, uh, one was uh, the Eterni Patris and the other Rerum Novarum. So it seems like when we need somebody uh, uh, <clears throat> as head of the church, uh, they seem to come along and, and um, set us back on the right course. Uh, Pope John Paul does not, of course, contradict Vatican I. He takes over from Vatican I the familiar ideas that reason has the power to establish the existence of God and the preambles of faith, and that faith confirms truths that reason cannot grasp except with great difficulty. The, that faith also embraces mysteries that lie entirely beyond the range of reason, and that reason can render even these revealed mysteries to some in degree intelligible. I, I don't have time to go into it, but uh, a, um, a, a theologian in the uh, 12th century by the name of Richard of St. Victor has a beautiful exposition of the Trinity and gives reasons as to why there have to be three persons. There can't be two, there has to be three, and from four on, you don't need it because it's redundant. And obviously it remains a mystery, but he takes this mystery and uses his uh, God-given reason in a very uh, uh, rational way to expound on the Trinity, and it's one of the finest things that I have ever encountered in terms of uh, uh, an exposition, further a rational exposition of that theological mystery. And it's interesting, I read it in a book by a, um, I can't think, a Swinburne, I think, Richard Swinburne, who is an, uh, a British, uh, not Catholic, but uh, Anglican uh, writer, and uh, he, I had access to it uh, through him, and it was really impressive. 
Unlike Vatican I, the Pope refrained from lamentations and anger, angry condemnations. In the spirit of Vatican II, he prefers to use what he calls the medicine of mercy. He sees himself as a friend and ally called to help philosophy to extricate itself from its present state of impoverishment. And believe me, uh, it ex uh, the impoverishment of philosophy exists in many of our universities, and unfortunately in, in quite a few of our larger Catholic uh, universities. The mind is drawn to ask about the meaning of life in the face of suffering and inevitable death. He portrays the truth of revelation as a fulfillment of the universal human longing for meaning and truth. In agreement with 20th century Jewish philosophers such as Martin Buber and Emmanuel Levinas, he is convinced that friendship and dialogue can best sustain reason in its search for the truth. Among the merits of contemporary philosophy, the Pope points out its welcome <clears throat> emphasis on personhood and some subjectivity. Um, one of the things that uh, I encountered in, in looking into this was uh, the work of uh, the late Father uh, Clark at Fordham, and he gave an Aquinas lecture in 1993 called Person and Being. In this lecture, Father Clark attempts to draw out and highlight a dynamic and relational notion of the person which seems to be implicit in St. Thomas's own metaphysics of being as existential act but was never made quite explicit by Thomas himself in his philosophical analysis of the person. Metaphysics makes it possible to ground the concept of personal dignity in the spiritual nature of the person. The Pope refers to signposts of the spirit which invite the mind to explore hidden truths. He speaks to discern the signs of revelation in the context of interpersonal communication. John Paul gives balance, emphasis to philosophy, Holy Scripture and Church Fathers. Chapter 2, dealing with Revelation, concerns itself at length with the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, and it resonates with the Pauline letters. Chapter 4, which concerns itself with the relationship between faith and reason, opens with a discussion of Paul and the Acts of the Apostles, and follows this with a survey of patristic thinking, that's the early Church Fathers thinking, from Justin and Clement to the Cappadocians, St. Basil, uh, Gregory, um, Naziazen and St. Gregory Nyssa, and finally Augustine. Interestingly, Pope Benedict has a two-volume publication on the Church Fathers and Teachers, published in 2008-2010. The Fathers, he concludes, were highly original in welcoming the unlimited dy dynamism of uh, reason and infusing it with human uh, dignity. But the doctrine of faith was a divine trust that God had committed to the Church to be faithfully preserved and expounded. Uh, I truly think that our early church fathers are what I call, a, a, again, a additional soft evidence of the proof of the existence of God and, and the Holy Spirit, because it's hard to believe that without inspiration that these men could write in the didache and in their various publications with the depth of understanding and insight that they had without being inspired. John Paul to softens this dualism between reason and faith. In the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, he tells us that we find a harmonious fusion of philosophy and theology. In the biblical wisdom literature and in the Greek and Latin fathers, he shows no sharp distinction was made. The profound unity between the two disciplines preserved until after the time of St. Thomas has regrettably been eroded in recent centuries. I would say the erosion started with uh, uh, Cartesian philosophy. The relationship between theology and philosophy, he writes, is best construed as a circle. God's word <clears throat> came to uh, meet the human quest for truth and is best understood with the help of philosophy. The revealed word keeps philosophy from going astray and at the same time stirs philosophy to explore new paths that it would not have discovered without revelation. Reason and faith are therefore not competitors. Each contains, the other, uh, <clears throat> each contains the other. The simultaneity of faith and reason in the Pope's thinking makes him reluctant to speak of either in isolation. Revelation and reason are two different paths, neither sufficient unto itself. Revelation perfects the work of reason in its quest for ultimate truth. Faith and reason converge as they turn toward Jesus Christ the eternal word of God, who is both creator and redeemer. Philosophical wisdom and theological wisdom have a deep affinity because both of them 
came to explore reality in terms of its ultimate principles. And that's, of course, what we have missing from the discipline of philosophy at most of our universities. They, they just do not teach metaphysics or uh, epistemology, let alone a realistic uh, metaphysics and epistemology uh, such as Thomism. <clears throat> there are two forms of acquired wisdom. The Pope takes a step beyond Vatican I by referring to a higher synthesis of both disciplines through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Vatican I made no reference to this higher synthesis. John Paul, in Faith and Reason, shows great esteem for St. Thomas. Quotes, the Church has been justified in consistently proposing St. Thomas as a model of thought and a model of the right way to do theology. He praises Leo XIII for having insisted on the incomparable value of philosophy of St. Thomas. I might say in my own opinion, the philosophy of St. Thomas, especially his metaphysics, is the most compatible philosophy today with the findings of uh, modern science, uh, beginning with the, the Big Bang Theory and, and Einstein's uh, um, theory of relativity. The Pope is also on guard against eclecticism, which takes over ideas from different philosophical systems without concern for their inner coherence. He also praises those recent philosophers who have adopted more contemporary currents of thought, such as the method of immanence and phenomenology. For my own part, those philosophers, especially the late Father Norris Clark of Fordham, have recognized themes implicit in St. Thomas, which had previously been ignored. His work is being continued at Ave Maria University in Naples, Florida, as well as at smaller but more traditional Catholic universities, offering much hope for the future of Catholic thought. They have truly achieved a creative retrieval of Thomistic philosophy. That's an expression, creative retrieval, that was coined by Father Clark and um, uh, written about extensively which includes a real being understood as grounded in existential act. Father Clark also identified and amplified the role of Platonic participation metaphysics. Participation metaphysics was further developed through the concept of the analogicity of being, which more clearly expresses Thomas's doctrine of the limitation of existence by essence, as well as the limitation of form by matter, and the central role of action as a natural overflow of the active existence in all beings. So all existential beings are intrinsically self-communicative, self-expressing, and self-revealing through their action. Hence the dignity of life and the sadness that uh, we are still doing the number of, uh, of abortions that we are doing in this country every year. This is the area of real progress in the implicit meanings of Thomas's writings. What is being drawn out is the necessity for relatedness for the full existential development of being. Like Vatican I and the popes of the last century, John Paul enumerates a variety of philosophical systems that he sees as injurious to faith and to authentic wisdom. Unlike Vatican I, which cites speedyism and idealistic rationalism as potentially injurious to our faith, <clears throat> um, he targets eclecticism, historicism, scientism, pragmatism, and nihilism. All of these tendencies call into question the capacity of, human, of the human mind to transcend the factual and the empirical. They implicitly deny the possibility of metaphysics, which paradoxically is a metaphysical statement in itself. And this is the thing to look for. These people tend to contradict themselves, and, and therefore their thinking tends to be uh, incoherent. Some forms of postmodernism, the Pope adds, uh, that, quotes, the time of certainties is irrevocably past and contends that we must, quotes, learn to live in a horizon of total absence of meaning where everything is provisional and ephemeral. In settling for such an absence of meaning, says the Pope, philosophy subverts its own project. I think I'm uh, going to skip down um, uh, and, and finish with the final uh, note on uh, John Paul. By comparing John Paul with uh, statements from Vatican I, it is possible to see the value of statements from Vatican I and the Pope's encyclical. Leo XIII took a positive step forward when he encouraged a revival of Thomistic philosophy. Vatican II made some further progress by pointing out the need for Catholics to be men and women of their time familiar with modern currents of thought. 
John Paul II presupposes these earlier documents and in no way disrespects or disavows them, but he uses a different method and speaks with a new uh, accent. With his keen sense of the variety of human cultures and historical eras, he is able to enter into a dialogue with many schools of thought. As a personalist and phenomenologist, he brings out hidden resources in the great tradition with which he identifies himself. If John Paul II is right, the light of revelation is no substitute for thought, but is the strongest possible ally of reason and <coughs> science. It can permeate the various disciplines, re-energizing them and bringing them into organic unity with one another. At this point, um, we can turn back now to science, scientism, and metaphysics. <coughs> If one word would suffice to name the disordered philosophy at the root of our current difficulties, it would be scientism. As noted earlier, scientism is a self-annihilating view that only empirical statements are scientifically meaningful, which is itself not a valid scientific claim. Now think of what it throws out if one is only committed to the imperial metric method or mode of investigation, which is uh, a combination of um, uh, empirical study of material being and assessing it quantit quantitatively. The form, uh, the form would be um, mathematics and, and the um, material causes would be the, the study of material being. Science relegates philosophical, religious, theological, ethical, and aesthetic knowledge to the realm of mere fantasy. Rejecting even such fundamental concepts as being Scientism impoverishes human thought. By embracing only simple facticity, leaving no space for the critique offered by the broader philosophical judgment, scientism is thus poised to dominate all aspects of human life through technological progress. As a result of this mentality, many think that if something is technologically possible, it is therefore morally permissible. And I think you know the things that I'm uh, immediately concerned with. And, it has a lot to do with, uh, obviously, uh, genetics. As a result of this mentality, many think that, oh, I said that, the Holy Father pointed out that such thinking widely circulates among the general culture as part of a supposedly enlightened view of the world, like the 20th century. The noted Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain observed that scientism is more of a danger to non-scientists than to scientists. In an industrial civilization where manipulation of the world through science and technique is unreasonably dominant, the intellectual habit it inculcates is to grant rational validity to value and facts only. He states, whereas scientists know at least what science is and what its limitations are, the non-scientists believe all the more naively that science is the only valid approach to reality. Well, that's what they're taught in, in, in many of our schools. In fact, it is increasingly prevalent to believe that science has all the rational answers which human life can need. Um, I'm not sure that uh, if you take a close look at the, at the Third Reich and, uh, and, and communism, you can come to that conclusion. Precisely because it rejects some fundamental modes of reasoning, scientism closes itself off to the possibility of deeper meaning. Some people welcome this, and some people are repelled by it. Scientism causes an extreme dualism where the life of faith and the life of reason exist simultaneously but separately. It is not unusual that Catholic scientists themselves consider compartmentalization as the arrangement most appropriate to both faith and reason, as though combining them would despoil both. A couple of examples are Kenneth Miller, a reasonably devout Catholic at Brown University, and Francis Collins, the former head of the Genome Project. I've read a, a lot of their writings and, and, and books, and they are basically theistic um, evolutionists, and um, leave, uh, they tend to try to put a wall of separation between their, uh, their, their religious life and the scientific life as if uh, the two are not compatible with one another. For such a scientist, faith acts at best as a moral compass or guide but the direction it provides does not breach the wall of separation and is neither aided by nor aids reason. As John Paul II and Father Stanley Jockey have noted, simple neutrality is no longer acceptable. We cannot continue to live in separate compartments pursuing total divergent interests from which we evaluate and judge the world. Scientism thus divides us by 
harboring a fragmented vision of the world. Science without faith is subject to idolatry and false absolutes. Religion without science is subject to error and superstition. Working together, each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish. People have accused Catholics of restoring, resorting to the God of the gaps argument to retain the relation to faith in the light of a reductive materialistic science which acknowledges only methodological naturalism as a preferred mode of investigation. This would eliminate any consideration of other non-reductive modes, even though reductionism is for all practical purposes superannuated and ignores many questions, many because of its incompleteness and inability to recognize the metaphysical nature and necessity of the answers which it proposes. Thus it appears that we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And if you think that this hasn't been an ongoing problem for a protracted period of time, I would uh, quote to you uh, some of the comments of Robert Hutchins, the late, uh, who's died a long time ago, Robert Hutchins, who was the president of Chicago University, and in 1936 was bewailing the fact that metaphysics was no longer a part of the curriculum. Now, Robert Hutchins was probably agnostic, and he was no great lover of philosophy, especially metaphysics, but he recognized that without metaphysics, there is no ordering, intelligible discipline which can recognize the formal object of each science and recognize that formal object in terms of appropriateness for study. So metaphysics has that ability plus its ability to study being as being and to offer, and I tend to like to use the word argument rather than proof, and to offer some of the best arguments for the existence of transcendency in God uh, that we can have. Um, I, I'm talking to you about that because I think uh, I can I can move on um, here or, we're, or we'll be here all day. Uh, that that's of course why I have the handout. Now I'd like to talk to you uh, a little bit about Anthony Rizzi, and uh, he is a published physicist who solved an 80 year old problem in Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. Uh, specifically, it was with respect to angular momentum, and he was able to define it, and nobody else, including Einstein, had been able to really do that. In 2004, uh, he published, and I, I want to end with uh, a quote from his book, The Science Before Science. Anthony Rizzi undertakes in this uh, work to reinvigorate his fellow scientists understanding of the foundations of science. A highly trained and accomplished physicist, well-skilled in the methodology of modern scientific research, Rizzi has been able to amplify and clarify Maritain's insights, Jacques Maritain, a great French Thomist, so that he can introduce and train his colleagues in the principles of natural philosophy that their modern education omitted. Rizzi clearly establishes that to do science at all requires an implicit acceptance of the basic principles of realism. And that makes him unique of modern day scientists and puts him in the camp of Einstein. Because Einstein was a realist and he argued via thought experiments with Niels Bohr and other scientists over the quantum theory until the day that he died, never accepting some of the idealistic conclusions that Bohr and other quantum theorists came to that simply beings of reason gave birth to reality and created the reality amongst us. Einstein said God, as he almost said, God does not play dice with the universe. It doesn't matter to me whether or not you can uh, know the momentum of something but not know the position or know the position not know the momentum of the particle. It doesn't matter because what you, behind what you measure is something that exists, that is ontological, that has being. And this has been the great failure of scientism, is to lump everything together into the what I call the imperial, and, and Rizzi calls the imperial metric mode of organization and conceptualization. That eliminates any realism that may lie behind your measurements and your quantitative approach. And if you remember, um, with respect uh, to organization of knowledge and classification, we have the level of what Aristotle called physica. This is a level of, of, of what Rizzi calls imperial schematic organization, 
we might go out and, and look at certain insects and classify them according to the part of their legs and the motion that it has. It doesn't employ anything quantitative. It, it just simply is used most commonly in biology and chemistry, that mode. The second mode is, is the imperial metric in which we use both the modes of observation of material being and the quantitative uh, mode of mathematics in order to come conclusions. And then, of course, there's the third level, which is the level that metaphysics investigates, which is the ontological level where we study being as being. And so, as Rizzi points out, many scientists are unaware of the metaphysical assumptions they have absorbed through training. They have become, that's one of the things. We all have a metaphysics, whether we want to admit it or not. If we say that we're nihilists or that we tell young people they have, there's no meaning in life, they have nothing to live for, and the suicide rate uh, escalates uh, now to, to the point where now the highest rate of suicide is not in old people like me, it's in people 15 to 24 years of age. Where do you think that comes from? It, it, uh, you know, if, you, if life is meaningless and has no purpose, um, that's going to have an impact, especially if uh, powerful minds are, are telling you that. In any event, um, he, he, he says that scientists have become fully acculturated the practice of, a jump, of, of jumping immediately to an empirical mathematical view. In fact, many in modern science act as though empirical mathematical knowledge is the only possible valid knowledge. Rizzi elucidates, like Maritain before him, the logical fallacies introduced by Descartes. The empirical mathematical method is useful and powerful in itself, but to be truly scientific, one can lose sight of the larger picture, the complete view of physical reality. Father Jockey's originality is in pointing out that the mathematical world model is inherently incomplete. According to his theorem, no sufficient broad set um, and he took this from Goodell, who, who published this in 1931. It's called Goodell's Theorem. According to Goodell's Theorem, no sufficient broad set of arithmetical proposition contains within themselves a proof of their own consistency. Although this seems to be confined solely to mathematics, Goodell's work centered on the system of integers. There is a meta-mathematical corollary. Applying this to a whole gamut of mathematics, such consistency cannot be proved within any set but rather another set of assumptions is required, a metamathematics, if you will. Yet to show the consistency of this metamathematical meta system, a further metamathematical system will be required. So the process continues in an endless regression, which means that in each set of rules for mathematical symbols points beyond itself. From this it follows, as Father Jockey argued, that even in the totally abstract thinking of theoretical physics, there is a boundary present as in all other fields of speculation. For those of you who are familiar with Aristotle's uh, uh, categories of being, remember that the, uh, the empirical or imperiological uh, mode of investigation really only looks at quantity and uh, to some extent, of course, uh, substance but it leaves out all the other categories such as quality and relation and time, location, place, et cetera. So it's very incomplete and narrow knowledge. It ignores, most of modern science today ignores two of Aristotle's four causes, efficient causality and final causality, and deals more or less with formal causality and um, uh, material causality only. So it's a very incomplete, and yet, you know, we're, we're teaching generations of students that this is the total answer to things. Um, I don't think so. I, and I, I think um, uh, this, um, An Antonio Rizzi is, is another standard bearer, and uh, maybe for Einstein in this case, since he solved an 80-year-old problem that hadn't been solved. Okay. For Jackie, Father Jackie, the all-important implication is that scientific cosmology can never be a threat to the fundamental contingency of the universe because it can never offer a complete methodological explanation of all of existence. And think how uh, the Big Bang theory has changed our whole way of looking at things. Uh, it, it again um, reinforces the idea of a created universe. And of course, uh, Father Jockey is, is, is famous for his uh, work on showing that the birth 
of science took place in the Middle Ages in Western civilization and in no other, um, in no other civilization because the Middle Ages recognized a created world. There was no need to recognize the world as one great big organism that went through cycles of rebirth, development, death, and rebirth again. It was free to study that created world because it was told through revelation that the world was created, that it was uh, separate from us, and that it was intelligible, ordered, and had principles that we could learn, uh, for, learn about and implement into the uh, system that we have today. Now, when, he, Jockey, when Father Jockey talks about the stillbirth of science and all these other civilizations, he isn't saying that they didn't make you know, uh, technological progress in certain areas. He's just saying that the birth of formal science, which employs observation, uh, uh, induction, uh, prediction, and experimental method, was born in the West and no other place. And that had, uh, had, had we not had St. Thomas, it, we might not be, I might not be standing here today and enjoying this afternoon uh, with all of the uh, accoutrements. Uh, and um, even somebody who was as uh, atheistic and as anti-religion as Ayn Rand said, and this reveals a little bit of her arrogance and narcissism, she said there, before her, before me, there were only one and a half philosophers, Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. And of course, he was only a half a philosopher because he was also a priest. And that's, but somebody like that with that antipathy for Christianity and for any form of religion could recognize the brilliance of his mind. And she thought that had he not appeared in the Middle Ages, we might not have uh, the development of science and technology uh, that we have today. Okay, um, I'm going to skip on because you can read uh, a lot of this, and, and I hope you do, and I hope you, you know, it helps in, in discussing these things with people who um, say that, you know, uh, science has all the answers to, uh, to everything. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about metaphysics. Uh, metaphysics, the science of being qua being, is alone capable of providing a satisfactory rational principle of order for the curriculum of a university, that is, an institution of higher learning engaged in teaching and investigating universal knowledge. This is true because metaphysics, hierarchically, is the first science in the natural order, and by its very nature, the ordering principle of the special, more limited scientists, sciences. There is no possibility of genuine conflict between metaphysics and theology as a Catholic university should require both a rational and a super-rational principle of ordering. One of the most important points to be emphasized in connection with the Aristotelian Thomistic concept of metaphysics is that this science is not only uh, a systematic uh, arrangement of other sciences, of other science, but it possesses its own distinctive nature and object. While metaphysics concerns itself with all beings, whatsoever. Being is its formal object. It concerns itself in this treatment only with those determinations of being which are either formally contained within or essentially connected with its own particular abstraction, which is to say that the formal objects of metaphysics are those forms or modifications of real entities which are sensible initially. In other words, we have to start in the real world and we have to start with sensorial experience. Um, Disorder is the chief characteristic of higher learning today. It has no ordering principle. It lacks the real unity which can be achieved only by a hierarchy of subjects indicating which are fundamental and which are subsidiary. It is important to remember that the more specialism succeeds, the more it isolates the learner and narrows the possibility of communication with other learners so that the ideal society of the specialist educator would logically be one in which nobody knew anything which anybody else knew. It is important to stress the wisdom, that wisdom is, an addition, is in addition to and not a contradiction of science. As somebody said, and I think it was again Paul Johnson, the great historian in his book, The Intellectuals, we have had more than enough brilliant men. We, we, we always have enough brilliant men to proceed, but we have very few wise individuals. So that distinction, I think, is, 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 is uh, critical. And I think it's critical because wisdom includes judgment. 
uh, as, as a process uh, uh, in, in uh, acquiring knowledge and maybe the last step. Uh, we all heard, you know, the, a, a dozen times Socrates was the wisest man because Socrates knew that he didn't know anything. It is important to stress, okay, real science and a naturalistic philosophy are simply two distinct things. And no matter how desperately the positivists may struggle to identify them, they remain distinct and make it entirely possible to retain and, and strongly emphasize the one while rejecting the other. However, experience gives us a wealth of examples created by intelligent agents. Um, this is talking a little bit about the principle of uniformity, which again allows us to order um, our sensorial experiences into concepts and then into understanding uh, uh, propositions and explanations and judgments. To uh, close, I would like to return um, to draw again on the work of uh, uh, Stanley Jockey, who, as you probably know, uh, died a little over a year ago. Um, there are many truths, and I've listed uh, specific books by him that I think are well worth reading. One that I, I didn't list and that I would recommend to anybody who's getting started with him for the first time is called The Savior of Science because you can get uh, vintage uh, jockey thinking from that book without uh, a humongous intellectual effort that some of his other books require, at least for me they did. We can, I, we can cull the following truths uh, with respect to the relation of faith, reason, and science from his many, many books and presentations, as well as from his only biographer, Father Paul Hafner. And I'll summarize these. One, there is no intrinsic contradiction between Christian faith and natural science. Science is of itself insufficient for human growth in understanding and human development. Scientific progress is part of human and spiritual progress. Four, just as grace perfects nature in a dynamic partnership, so also is Christian faith like a guiding star, which leads science to a deeper and more perfect understanding of its role within human experience. Five, science cannot be regarded as having so much autonomy that its applications and philosophy may be followed, even if they contradict faith, morals, and the dignity of the human person. Six, the magisterium of the church can and should pronounce on scientific issues which have a strong bearing on faith or morals or have implications for other aspects of Christian life. It would be rash to attribute to God that which is still accessible to science. For if and when science has achieved a discovery of the stated areas, the power of God may appear to be reduced. This is the God of the gaps era. It is an error to hold that in the order of created things there is immediately manifested to, hum to the human intellect something divine in itself such that it belongs to the divine nature. Nine, science arrives at some truths but not all truth, especially if it is not measurable, quantifiable, or mathematically expressible. If science steps out of si sight of those parameters, it needs to tread carefully because it is probably... Um, spouting a lot of metaphysical uh, uh, assumptions or presuppositions uh, that need to be, that can be challenged and, and will be found to be incorrect. Correct. Notwithstanding our increasing theoretical and applied knowledge in science and technology, it would be an error to exclude immediate and direct intervention of God in his creation in a miraculous way. For although we are bound by the laws of nature, God is not. The mediation of philosophy and especially of metaphysics is required in relating Christian faith and natural science. And finally, among the chief implicit presuppositions of science are that the material entities observed have a coherent rationality and are governed by consistent laws forming a consistent whole. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna close at this time by coming back to the point that the church has always sponsored knowledge. Even, uh, without going into great detail, even the Galileo affair has been misinterpreted and misrepresented. Galileo, uh, indeed, um, wanted uh, to publish uh, in two world systems his heliocentric theory of the universe. He was told by the church that he should hold off on it, that there wasn't, he didn't have enough proof to offer that we were going through the Reformation, that we were still trying 
to bring back uh, Protestants, if they could, to the Catholic faith. And of course, the church was being criticized heavily for the support it was giving science because uh, original Protestants were very literal interpre uh, interpreters uh, of, of the Bible. And so he was told this. He was given support by all sorts of, of Jesuit priests who agreed with him, but also told him that you don't have enough evidence of this yet uh, to come out with it as a, more than a hypothesis. Uh, he refused to do this, of course, and, and published it anyway as, as, as fact. And he basically uh, received a house, house uh, confinement uh, as his punishment. And it's interesting, if you read about the, the alleged churches, uh, anti-intellectualism, anti-science, etc. It's all this Galileo thing that's brought up. That should tell you something. There isn't anything else, really, uh, that, you, that you can find that's a, a major indication of that. The church has always sponsored that. And, and to, to end this, I'm, I'm going to just um, list some things here uh, that, sh that prove that to, to a great degree. For example, Father Nicholas Steno is often identified as the father of geology. The father of Egyptology was Father Anthony Kircher. The first person to measure the rate of acceleration of a freely falling body was a priest. Um, also, the first person to describe inertia was in the uh, 15th century, no, 14th century, Jean Buridan and Orazem. They paved the way. You remember Newton said, I stand on the shoulder of giants. Which giants? Well, they were the giant thinkers, which you know usually were... Uh, of the clergy in, in the Middle Ages. Father Roger Boscovich is often credited as the father of modern atomic theory. He was a genuine polymath accomplished in atomic theory, optics, mathematics, and astronomy. He was elected to learned societies and pre prestigious scientific academies across Europe. Father Boscovich was also an accomplished poet, composing Latin verse under the auspices of Rome's prestigious Arcady Academy. It is little wonder that he has been called the greatest genius Yugoslavia has ever produced. Benedict XIV, one of the most learned popes of his day, turned to him for his technical expertise in 1742 after concerns had arisen that cracks in the dome of St. Peter's Basilica portended possible collapse. He accepted Father Boscovich's recommendation that five iron rings be used to circle the cupola. Father Boscovich's report, which investigated the problem in theoretical terms, earned for him, quotes, the reputation of a minor classic in architectural statics. A modern scholar states that this accomplished priest gave the first coherent description of an atomic hypothesis well over a century before modern atomic theory emerged. A recent historian of science calls Father Boscovich, quotes, the true creator of fundamental atomic physics as we understand it. Jesuits so dominated the study of earthquakes that seismology became known as the Jesuit science. And that is far from all. Even though some 35 craters on the moon are named for Jesuit scientists and mathematicians, the church's contribution to astronomy are all but unknown to the average educated American. The Roman Catholic Church gave more financial aid and social support to the study of astronomy for over six centuries from the recovery of ancient learning in the Middle Ages into the Enlightenment than any other or probably all other institutions. Still, the Church's true role in the development of modern science remains one of the best kept secrets of modern history. As we have seen, Catholic theological ideas provided the basis for scientific progress in the first place. No serious scholar today will repeat the tired mythology about the alleged antagonism between religion and science. The appearance of modern science in the Catholic environment of Western Europe was no coincidence after all. The time has come when every evidence has been supplied to the world that natural science alone cannot guide civilization aright. On the other hand, the false light of deceptive modern philosophies have definitely led men into the destructive quicksands of such godless ideologies as Marxism, communism, fascism, logical positivism, atheistic existentialism, linguistic analysis, and postmodernity with its moral relativism and nihilistic Darwinism, all related in their common errors. Unfortunately, these philosophical theories are still being taught in many of our universities as if they had equal value and validity to young, impressionable, and unsophisticated students. You know, it may be true for you, but it isn't necessarily true for me. 
So this spills over. The moral relativism spills over into what is being taught. It's, uh, our, many of our universities have ruled out hierarchy of being. That's why you can get somebody like Peter Singer at Princeton University who says it's perfectly okay. Uh, parents should be allowed up to about two years of age to decide whether they want their child or not. If they don't want it, they should be allowed to kill it. And so this is what you have uh, when, you, when you eliminate hierarchy of being and when you eliminate moral absolutes, which are, are definitely there. This is a... This is a con consequences. Ideas have consequences, and these are some of the consequences. And moral relativism, without getting in, sidetracked on a whole other topic, is self-refuting. Is the statement that, are, that all morals are relative, is that a relative statement or an absolute statement? If it's an absolute statement, you've refuted your own uh, conviction. If it's a relative statement, then it's not worth anything more than any other statement that, that's given. So, and that, and you can, one can go on with this. And one of the things you can do with time is you can recognize the incoherence of this type of thinking. Unfortunately, these well, I said that natural law, inalienable human rights, and the unchanging moralities based on nature and God are too frequently glibly flouted in classrooms that should be sacred to the truth. Our renewal of a right way of life for nations and individuals must therefore be dependent on a revival of thought that is based on sound methods of teaching and on the best wisdom of the past. These methods must emphasize that there is no intrinsic conflict between faith, reason, and science. In summary, the relation of faith and reason is a unique, unique blend of the positive elements of both rationalism and fideism, fideism of presupposition and evidence. Thomas stresses the need for reason before, during, and even after believing. Even the mysteries of faith are not irrational. On the other hand, Aquinas does not believe that reason alone can bring us to faith and belief of God. In his Summa, he goes into great detail for very practical reasons why we can't uh, all uh, have access uh, to all of his thought and metaphysics. We, we have jobs, we have families, we get tired, we aren't uh, interested enough to pursue it, it's, it's very difficult, etc. He, he offers all of these in his Summa Theologica. This is accomplished only by the grace of God. And that's why we need revelation and grace. This reason and evidence are never coercive of faith. There is always room for non-believers to not believe in God, even though a believer can construct a valid proof that God exists. I would say valid argument. For reason can be used to demonstrate that God exists, but it can never in itself persuade someone to believe in God. Only God can do this, work, working by his grace, in and through free choice. This unique synthesis of faith and reason provides further reason to believe that old Aquinas should never be forgotten. Amen. Okay. That's it. <laughs> this, this book it, it takes thought. This is by Anthony Rizzi, The Science Before Science. It's endorsed, um, uh, I think the prologue or, or the foreword is, is written by the late Ralph McInerney, Notre Dame's greatest Thomistic philosopher of the 20th century. Uh, you probably all know and have heard of Ralph McInerney. He's also the uh, fiction writer who wrote the uh, uh, Father Dowling stories that uh, became a television series and his book, uh, fictional book, The Red Hat, is one of the best I've ever read on the politics of becoming a cardinal. And um, uh, I attended a symposium for him in memoriam uh, with my wife uh, this past week, a year ago in January, mm -hmm. right, at uh, uh, Ave Maria College in Naples. And uh, we had, uh, it's interesting, the Renaissance in Thomas philosophy is not, uh, not within the Jesuits uh, right now, it's the Dominicans themselves. Who and, and there were just uh, dozens of people from Europe who were all Dominicans who were attending this symposium in honor of Ralph McInerney. So I, I would say he's one of the greatest uh, uh, Thomistic philosophers of the 20th century. And I had the privilege of reading most of his works and having him guide some of my thinking, which is uh, far more limited than his uh, over the years. But I would really recommend this book, even though it's tough. The Science Before Science by Anthony Rizzi, A Guide to Thinking in the 21st Century, because he really nails it to, to the wall. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, that's... Oh, I was, 
I was going to ask you which universities you think are teaching. Well, I can tell you some of them. Dallas University, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in Houston. St. Thomas Aquinas, I forget where on the coast it is. Oh, right. Oh, 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 California. California. Okay, yeah. Um, um, of course, Ave Maria. You can get a master's and a PhD, and it's going to be mostly in, in, in Thomistic philosophy uh, with it. That, that's a wonderful school, and uh, one Catholic, one good Catholic got that off the ground. Thomas Monaghan from Domino Pizzas, and, and owner of the Detroit um, Tigers, when he retired, he wrote a check for a billion uh, to get that off the ground. They just recently transferred the last school to the campus at uh, it's 20 miles east of Naples, and that was the law school is there. So they have the law school, and then they have the undergraduate school. And with their work, and his, he's now uh, stepped down. He's the same age I am, 74. He stepped down. He said, that's enough is enough. Um, and is now doing the PR work for them throughout the country. They have managed to keep the tuition down for the kids to $10,000 a year which is almost unheard in today's world. I went to Marquette University uh, uh, in, in, in Milwaukee, and I think their tuition is up to uh, close to $30,000. My son in law is somewhere between ten and 15000 when he was in the engineering school. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I mean, and I paid, I think, $650 a semester <laughs> for tuition. Although you departs from what's wrong with the Jesuits? What? What's wrong with the Jesuits? I don't know. Liberate, I'll tell you what, liberation theology. Really? A lot of them got hooked in by it. And I don't know if you remember, but they had the Land of Lakes Conference in 1964 in northern Wisconsin. And Theodore Hesburgh, oh, to his discredit, to his eternal discredit, championed all of this and, and talked about how Notre Dame was going to go its separate way. You know, I don't know if any of you get orthodoxy, but I, I do. It's a magazine. And, the alumni that right in there who, who won't donate anymore to Notre Dame, who are angry with Notre Dame, it ends up with Notre Dame with the philosophy department to which uh, Ralph McInerney. Uh, what about Georgetown? Uh, and, you know, Georgetown, what? very similar. And my school is, is headed in that direction to Marquettes. They did not sign up for the Land of Lakes thing at the time, but gradually and gradually, we, we, are be, we forget that we are Roman Catholics. We're not. You know, just American Catholics. Well, the saddest experience I had was my 50th reunion went last year at St. Joe's College, Philadelphia, St. Joe's University, going into the uh, chapel, and there was no, there was no tabernacle. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. Uh, yeah, that's that's very sad because they're yeah. they're they're missing the boat. We're we're, we're in yeah. big trouble. I, I I mentioned that Anne Glynn's book, uh, How Civilizations Decline. Uh, looking in the mirror or whatever the, the title of it is. And she's got it outlined beautifully. Another fellow by the name of Harold Brown has written a book called The Sensate Culture, in which he uh, outlines the gradual drift towards a, a, a totally almost materialistic sensate society and how that erodes spirituality and erodes the greater meaning in life. And personally, as a psychiatrist, I saw it with youth with the suicide rate go up and invariably I guess that uh, made me think an awful lot like Carl Jung did, that aside from the, the hardcore uh, organic psychoses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and some of those things, the rest of them at the core are a spiritual problem that you used to come to my office. I also saw a shift from what I used to call high-level neurotics like myself who would come to see me and have conflicts that you could work on and resolve and really help them along the way personality disorders, mm -hmm. specifically narcissistic personality disorder, and it is really hard. Uh, they need to be in therapy for a protracted period of time to get through that narcissism. Can you help me with the traffic cameras? <laughs> yeah. Not a real problem. <laughs> but you're, you're absolutely right. That is a real, uh, a real sadness that I've experienced yeah. over the years, too, is that uh, uh, the spirituality is, is tenuous. And, and Yet, the way I, the reason I take heart in all of this is, is that um, I think I kind of got you into a course of some of your friends on the papacy. And what we discovered is, as depressing as it, some of the parts of the papacy are, is somebody always comes along and puts the church back on the right track 
And even the worst popes never challenged the main doctrines of the church. They didn't tamper with those, as bad as they were, bothering children and you know just uh, uh, totally inadequate for the uh, being a cardinal or, or whatever they, the nepotism allowed for. They never tampered with the essential body of church doctrine as outlined, you know, by the early church fathers during the patristic period and in the didache uh, of the church. So that to me gives a lot of hope. That to me means that the Holy Spirit somehow is there and, and is still helping out. But I read where the majority of people back in the Middle Ages did believe in God, the good and the bad. Well, for today, it's not, you know, it's Look at the cathedrals. Well, some, somebody uh, had enough spirituality yeah. to build all those cathedrals over 55 in France alone. You'll never see that happen again, probably, although I won't uh, in my lifetime. But, but uh, you know, there had to be some real spirituality yeah. and spiritual movement uh, to get anybody to do that. There, there, there's an interesting comment. Maybe I will leave it at that. There's a statue that. of Galileo, I heard, in Rome now, right? <laughs> I think. Let me just yes. share this with you. I, you know, I mean, the renowned historian Lynn White says of the Christian monks, for the first time, the practical and the theoretical were embodied in the same individuals. In antiquity, learned men did not work, and the workers were not learned. The monk was the first intellectual to get dirt under his fingernails. In his very person, he destroyed the old artificial barrier between the empirical and the speculative, and thus helped create a social atmosphere favorable to scientific and technological development. It is no accident, therefore, that the friars were eminent and ardent in experiment. And, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, you're dealing with an era in which, unless you were with the clergy or in politics are very wealthy, uh, you didn't even read or write. Uh, with it. So thank you for putting up with all that. <laughs>